Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, this is part two, chapter three, part two of uh, a digital gaming and media playground. All right. And of course, in part one, we talked a, a lot of numbers. We talked about, uh, you know, how much the uh, industry is valued at. Uh, we talked about the fact that esports are now, of course, becoming a major part of the mass communication landscape, even exceeding, uh, obviously, uh, traditional sports. And now I want to focus uh, on this part two, on this particular uh, time frame of the history video game genres, right? Uh, so history will be basically talking about everything from the beginning of essentially what was gaming to, to modern day, uh, that we're going to get into video game genres and of course wrap it up with advertising. And again, a reminder that part three We'll be dealing with some uh, some some pretty uh, some pretty heavy topics when it comes to video gaming. So, let me call up the PowerPoint here uh, that you should be familiar with by now because it is in your uh, week three module. And so, either you can uh, you know kind of I guess just look at it before you look at it after I should say after we do this video or or just you know you know you can certainly just play along here. So. Anyway, but bottom line is, uh, I would uh, absolutely encourage you to watch this entire video because a lot of what I talk about will be on a future quiz uh, or midterm or final. Okay, so themes for this lecture, uh, by and large, uh, are going to be essentially the first two. The part three will be more of gaming as a social medium, and then of course the role of digital gaming in our democratic society. That a lot of that will be hitting uh, a little bit later, but certainly we're going to be talking a lot about the history of electronic gaming, the evolution of electronic gaming. Uh, these are our, our most important themes. So let's get into it. All right. So, of course, we talked about, obviously, Internet history um, in Chapter 2. Uh, and, of course, the Internet had its foundations in uh, something that wasn't necessarily uh, a consumer based. It eventually became that way. Um, gaming has, you know, I would say for the most part been something that has over time evolved, uh, you know, it, it has, it's had its it connection to what we call leisure time, um, even, you know, in the 19th century, in the very beginning, uh, even to today, of course, in 2022. And one thing that we'll be uh, actually uh, talking about from time to time is the Industrial Revolution and what it affect, what its effect was on various forms of mass communication. So just so you, if you've never uh, really kind of uh, paid attention in history, you probably uh, already know that the Industrial Revolution uh, took place in this country uh, by and large in the back half of the 19th century, that was in the 1800s, and then it carried itself into the early part of the 20th century. And so essentially um, the Industrial Revolution um, as, uh, wasn't simply though about um, mass production. It also promoted mass consumption and the emergence of leisure time. So you know, uh, for, for example, people were moving from farms and rural areas in the US to cities and were starting to go to work in factories and putting in long hours in these factories as they were of course uh, making goods uh, that you know as the population grew uh, were consuming. And so, uh, these hours were long. They were sometimes in these factories six days a week, sometimes seven days a week. And so when they would come home, um, there was this like, you know, obviously this desire to do something to exhale stuff that we do today, right? Um, you know, we may not work seven days a week, but certainly I think you could point to a lot of different activities we do uh, when it comes to leisure time. For example, uh, watching, you know, going to a film, although not so much the last two years because of the pandemic, but certainly think about how many, how much time have you spent on your couch or in your den watching like Netflix or any kind of streaming platform or how often do you find yourself, um, you know, I, I would say pre-pandemic and now as we sort of kind of on the back end, think about how many times you've gone to say a high school sporting event or a professional game or something that just sort of, uh, it's just, you know, is leisure time, right? And of course, uh, probably the elephant in the room is the fact that, you know, you probably play a lot of video games, which is also uh, considered part of your leisure time. But back to the 1800s, by the late 19th century, I should say, 
The availability of leisure time had sparked the creation of mechanical games. So um, you actually, and so as you can see here, there were money-making opportunities for media makers, right? And so in the 1880s, you see the emergence of uh, coin-operated contraptions, right? They were found in penny arcades. So we first start to see the penny arcade show up in the late 1800s. And in these penny arcades, uh, you could see things like strength testers and simulated bowling, horse racing, football, these really, really simplistic mechanical games. We're not talking anything on a screen. Uh, that hadn't happened yet, of course. That wasn't possible. But certainly people were finding their way you know, into these areas so they could have some fun, right? That's what we mean by leisure time. Well, then, of course, the, the game that I think most people think of when they think of like old time gaming is pinball. But what's interesting is that actually, um, you know, pinball was actually um, something called, uh, was first called something called Bagatelle. Uh, and it was, uh, interestingly enough, it was um, a game that didn't have the flipper bumpers. So we'll talk kind of how that sort of develops here in a little bit. But you would find these games in, in train depots, in hotel lobbies, in bars and restaurants, right? Um, and, uh, you know, of course, penny arcades. All right, anyway. Um, so Bagatelle, right, spawned what's called pinball. And so why is that? Because in the early iterations of, of pinball, which then was known as Bagatelle, again, as I say, there were no flipper bumpers. and um, it was seen as a game of chance because if, if you ever played pinball, right, you flick the ball up, ball bounces around, and of course you use the flippers to, you know, if you're if you're adept at using the flippers like I was when I was a kid, you know, you could sit there and play on on one ball for a, a quite a long time before eventually it would, you know, go through the slot. You'd have to put another one in play. So there was skill to it, right? But that wasn't the case in Bagatelle because. The ball would bounce around. You'd be kind of at the mercy of gravity, right? Well, there were uh, the government wasn't happy about the fact that it was a game of chance, and so there was a lot of local municipalities and counties and whatnot that would ban this game out of uh, would not allow this game to be placed in uh, in penny arcades or bars or et cetera because they saw it as a game of chance. Well, when they created the flipper bumpers in the 1940s, that actually took it from a game of chance to a game of skill. Thus, it became the game of pinball, which I think is very, very interesting, right? Um, I guess a maybe a modern example of that is the slot machine, if you think about the slot machine being just kind of random. So anyway, we can make, gotta drink some water there. All right, so as we get into the 40s and 50s, one of the things that gets developed in the gaming industry, which is very important, is what's called the cathode, cathode ray tube, cath, I'm sorry, cathode ray tube, CRT. Right. And it was its first patent was issued in December of 1948 to Thomas T. Goldsmith and Estel Ray Mann. Right. Uh, you know, it was basically used. It was an image. It was used for images in analog television. That's what it was originally designed for. And then those same that same technology was later applied to the, you know, essentially the video gaming industry um, where you start to see it pop up in the early 70s. So. Uh, the invention didn't do much, at least initially, but it is responsible for the CRT, which later provided the images for analog television and early computer displays. Computer geeks developed games using CRT as a novelty, but computer mainframes too, were too big at the time to be consumer friendly. That, of course, changes. But as folks uh, bought more televisions and computers got smaller, uh, please see the transistor, right? That was a big... Uh, obviously, uh, in chapter two, I think we talked the, the transistor, and that really was a game changer, along with, you know, obviously microchips. The first home TV game called Odyssey was released in 1972 for $100, Odyssey, all right? It used and it sold for 100 bucks. It used game controllers, moved dots of light around the screen in a 12-game inventory, it was simple. It was simple aiming in sports games. And Magnavox, the company that created it, uh, sold 300,000 consoles, which is pretty pretty impressive. You consider it was 100 bucks back in the 1970s. So that's a lot of money. Also in 1972, a computer engineer by the name of Nolan Bushnell uh, created a video game development called Atari. Its first creation 
was a game called Pong, right? And if you, I'm, I'm not going to call it up, but certainly if you want, go to YouTube, Google Pong, P-O-N-G, see what it looks like. It's literally two paddles and a blip going back and forth. Very simple. First game I ever played as a video game. I was fascinated by it. In any event, Nolan Bushnell was the first, it was a two-dimensional style tennis game with two vertical paddles. And it quickly became the first video game to become popular in arcades, all right? And so in 1975, Atari and Sears, uh, Sears Roebuck, a department store, teamed up and two years later, Bushnell, um, with the, you know, the seed money from this, this game that he invented, opened up a pizza arcade restaurant chain that you may have heard of called Chuck E. Cheese. So Nolan Bushnell, if you are ever want to, you know, bust that out at a party was, you know, when you think of Chuck E. Cheese, that was actually a Nolan Bushnell creation who had created, a, you know, obviously Pong. And then of course created Atari, uh, the company Atari, which by the way, he later sold, uh, he sold Atari for 28 million bucks, um, which is just a pittance in today's uh, era. But Atari folded in 1984, but it plowed the field for Nintendo, Sony, Microsoft to transform the video gaming industry. Another game that you see up there on your screen is called Intellivision. Um, and that was, you know, a game that a Mattel product that I played um, as a kid. So um, most video games, though, I would say by the late 1970s, um, you know, if you were playing a video game, you were playing it either at home or you were playing it in an arcade. And, I, and, and they were very, very popular in arcades. And of course, you're looking at an asteroids. This right here is an asteroids machine. Um, you know, this, uh, Miss Pac-Man, Pac-Man, Centipede, Missile Command. There were all these like, you know, basically huge games that they would put in 7-Elevens and they'd put them in bars and they'd put them in restaurants. And, and you know, there was a, you know, an a big arcade that was like a Dave and Buster's, um, you know, at the 405, where the 405 and the 101 came together. And, and so, you know, you'd go in there and you'd throw quarters in there and, you know, um, it was just an absolute cash machine, right? But there were your early games, Asteroids, Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, by the way, a lot of people don't know that Donkey Kong actually was the game that sort of gave birth to the character Super Mario, which I think is kind of funny. But anyway, um, in a way, arcade signaled uh, electronic gaming's potential as a social medium, uh, because many games allow players to play against each other. And oftentimes, you know, uh, you know, you go out there with your buddies. And of course, now gaming has been uh, superseded by a console and computer um, and phone, right? There's still Dave and Busters out there, but, but certainly the idea of going to a video arcade, much less prevalent. I've seen it happen on this campus where they used to have an arcade, <clears throat> and they don't have it anymore. It used to be right, right next to the cafeteria if you've ever been on campus here at COC. As for home consoles, right? Um, well, uh, the first was actually, um, I guess, obviously, the, the first would be Atari. Uh, that would be the first. 2600 in 1977 was an 8-bit um, basically, you know, that's that, that, that represents speed and graphics, right? Nintendo released its first system in 1983 as an 8-bit as well. Then Sega Genesis came along in 16-bit. Um, that was 1989. Later consoles featured 32, 64, you know, and on it goes up to 256, right? Um, but anyway, the three, um, um, the uh, three major home console makers now compete for gamers. That would be Nintendo. Uh, Sony and Microsoft, right? These are your three, you know, biggies, right? Nintendo released the Wii in 2006. The device supported traditional video games, but it was the first of the three major consoles to uh, add a wireless motion sensing controller, which took the secondary nature out of gameplay. Uh, Nintendo in 2012 introduced the Wii U, uh, which features the gamepad. The Sony PlayStation introduced its first series in 1994. Now it's up to PlayStation 5, I believe, which boasts more than 150 million users on its free online network. Um, and of course, Microsoft introduced Xbox in 2001. It debuted a number of innovations similar to Sony, but Microsoft 
Uh, obviously, Microsoft, by the way, just just recently bought um, Activision too. So uh, big, you know, obviously huge amount of money in the uh, in the console. So I don't know if you're an Xbox user, or PlayStation. Um, you know, my kids have been Xbox forever, <clears throat> but I know they have friends who have PlayStation. So and maybe you're a Nintendo. I don't know. I had a Wii. The last one I personally owned before I started buying stuff for my kids was the Wii. So uh, I know that dates me. All right. So with the rise of the and of course. With the rise of the internet, I should say, uh, and faster process speeds, elaborate pers uh, personal computer games attracted less attention, and the gaming world has been transformed, right? Uh, Dreamcast was the first console to feature a built-in modem. Uh, gaming emerged as an online multiplayer social activity. Dreamcast soon fizzled, but online connections are now a normal part of console video games with internet uh, connected players opposing each other in combat, working together against a common enemy, teaming up to achieve a common goal. All this stuff you already know, right? But the fact is, is that um, it is gaming has completely emerged in so many ways as an online multiplayer social activity. You know, I know that my, uh, <clears throat> my daughter is constantly playing either Fortnite or Minecraft late at night and, you know, has the headset on and is playing with her friends. And it's just a completely different experience because it, in my day, it was literally having guys come over, friends come over, you know, you'd have to go, you'd have to sit there right on the couch together. Now you can kind of do it in your own homes. And it's been, I, I think the perfect, in many ways, the perfect antidote, if you will, to, you know, maybe the isolation of COVID, right? So anyway, the internet enabled the spread of video ga games to be converted, uh, sorry, to converge devices, tablets, mobile phones, making games more portable, creating whole new segments of the gaming industry. And of course, uh, if you uh, paid attention in part one, then you know <clears throat> that the uh, mobile gaming, particularly phone, phone and watch gaming is more, you know, is, it, it dominates the market now, right? Um, also, there's a term you might want to Familiarize yourself with is MMORPGS, which stands for uh, Massively Multiplayer Online Role, Pay Role Playing Games. That's a mouthful. Massively Multiplayer Online Role Playing Games. That is an MMORPG. Uh, World of Warcraft is the considered the number one still MMORPG. I sometimes get uh, ar you know arguments from from some of my hardcore gamers in class, but Last I looked, uh, I don't know if I have the stat in front of me. I think I may do here, hold on a second. Yes, it is as of uh, Blizzard's earning in the second quarter of second quarter of last year, I mean, in 2021, the game has about 26 million active players. So as of <clears throat> basically midsummer, it's it was at 26 million players. So that's still considered at least, uh, you know, when you Google what is the biggest MMORPG, that is what comes up. All right, we move on. Digital games made initial appearances on computers. Of course, now they're on consoles. Okay. Um, basically, uh, games can be consumed in the same way that music is, books are, TVs and films are consumed. Everything has, of course, gone completely digital. Um, consoles have become entertainment centers. So you're not only just using your, you know, your console to, to you know, play your games, but you can also watch Netflix. And, you know, um, it, you know, I know some of the older, the ones that have obviously some of the, you know, still have the DVD capability, you can actually play, you know, a DVD in them, right? So, um, that's something that's very interesting when it comes to convergence, right? Um, it's open doors to social gaming, to virtual worlds. I mean, it's, uh, you know, again, um, it's, 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 it's just basically, um, you know, really become part of our, of our social landscape, right? Uh, you guys all have friends. I know that, that basically, um, you know, they probably have friends that are just immersed in their basement and in their, your bedroom and, and house playing video games, and maybe you're one of those people. And of course, we'll talk more about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing coming up here in part three. But but certainly, it's it's part of the uh, it's part of the deal. So uh, I will have to get back to you. Uh, I'm in the middle of a lecture.
All right. Sorry, guys. I'm in my office. All right. Portable players and mobile gaming. Um, so the it's basically changed the way, I should say, the portable and mobile gaming convergence, right, which has happened over the past, particularly over the last, in, in I would say, in major terms over the last five to 10 years, is changing the way people look at digital games and their systems. The games themselves are no longer confined to arcades or home television. Uh, mobile media has gained power as entertainment tools reach a wider and more diverse audience. Thus, gaming has become an everyday form of entertainment, right? Um, that's on par with with uh, television and film. In fact, um, I don't have the stat in front of me, but I can tell you that the money spent on video games is, is triple what is spent, more than triple what is spent on film. Triple. So think about how much money in film there is, right? Uh, video gaming actually triples that. All right, so just let me give you a sense of a little bit of, of how big, like you see the, the, the A, right, on the screen there. And of course, that's your app, your apps, right? So Apple, for example, um, these are numbers that are behind, but I can tell you that Apple has sold over a billion iPhones. It, it sold at one point 225 million iPads. Um, you know, there are well several hundred thousand games available in your app store. And it's not just on your, obviously your iPhone, we're talking about Androids as well, but it's just made the idea of being able to play games just so much more convenient and easy. And again, um, it's put like, for example, you know, game stops and video game stores that were once you know, dotted the landscape, much like video stores, it's, it's kind of kicked them to the curb because it's so much more easy, you know, to do it in a, in a, um, uh, in a uh, you know, mobile way, I should say. All right, let's talk about uh, video game genres. All right, I promised that as well in this, uh, in this part two. So um, none of this will come as I'm sure, uh, you know, breaking news to you, but here are your video game genres, your leading video game genres, right? What types of games people are playing, uh, action and shooter games, which are extremely popular, adventure games, role-playing games, strategy and simulation games, casual games, sports, music, dance. Where do you fall in there, right? Um, clearly, these are all very popular. Uh, forms. Um, I can say that probably my two forms are in most cases are sports. Um, you know, I like to play golf games and I played, you know, Madden growing up. And I also used to like to play SimCity all the time, which I guess you would consider in strategy and simulation games. That's why SimCity's there. All right, communities of play inside and out. Virtual communities often crop up around online video games and fantasy sports leagues. They include PUGs, which is, stands for pickup groups. Temporary teams assembled by matchmaking programs can range from elite players to noobs. I, I had not heard of that term until you know a few years ago, but that's a clueless beginner apparently. Um, they also form outside games through website, even face-to-face -face gatherings, right? Um, um, you know, it, I would say pre-pandemic, and I think I would assume post-pandemic, um, you know, there's the, you know, people like to get together for these conventions and expos and, um, you know, talk gaming. And of course, uh, you've got uh, no question, you've got, when we were talking about esports, you've also got YouTube and you've got Twitch, right? So, I mean, it's, it's just basically in all sorts of, uh, you know, different spots that you can now um, you know, talk to uh, talk to friends, talk to experts, and oh, by the way, uh, on YouTube you can also through through uh, you know people that do this for a living, you can find hacks, right? As my son calls them, game hacks, right? So you see it right there. Some are encouraged to modify the game. I, I remember my son used to love doing, love trying to cheat games. Sorry, Kyle. Sorry to out you. All right, this is a little bit. Um, a little bit out of place, but I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll show it to you anyway. Video game genres, here's your pie chart. This actually should be a little bit higher up, but uh, you know, probably right under video game genres. But anyway, uh, you can see that, that the action and shooter games, certainly the, the biggest part of, of the pie. All right, um, how about trends and issues in digital gaming, right? The ever-growing relationship between video games and other media, such as books, movies, and television leaves no doubt that digital gaming has a permanent place in our culture. 
right? A virtual billboard in a video game is usually more than just a digital prop as it is in television and movies. It's a paid placement. And let me say that when it comes to advertising, you know, the fact is, is that your generation is straying away from traditional forms of media. So you're not reading newspapers anymore. You're not watching television anymore. If you are watching television, it's done through Netflix, et cetera, right? So the fact is, is that if you're if you're a business and you're trying to you're trying to reach your demographic, your age demographic, 18 to you know 35 or 18 to you know early 40s, a lot of you now are immersing yourself in the video gaming universe. And so it makes sense that uh, or or you're spending a lot of time on social media with YouTube and et cetera. So think about where you see your ads now, right? You see, when you go to YouTube, for example, you see a bunch of ads when you play, you click on a YouTube video, you have to deal with like a five, 10 or 15 second ad. Um, if you are uh, in the video game world, you're going to get advertising within the games, you're gonna get advertising around the games, you're gonna get, if you're a Hollywood film, for example, you're gonna to wanna to connect yourself to a video game so that you know you can do some cross, what I call cross pollination, but yeah. So um, video games are a venue for advertising. They're also a subject of growing concern, but we'll hit that in part three, just so you know. But let's get to um, let's get to the advertising first, right? So beyond the immediate industry, electronic games have had a pronounced effect on media culture. First of all, they've inspired movies. Okay, so not only from an advertising standpoint, but from a creative standpoint. Think about um, you know some of the games out there that have that have inspired movies. Um, you know some classics. I don't, know if I don't really want to call them classic, but I would say some old school films like Tomb Raider, Warcraft, Assassin's Creed, the Resident Evil uh, uh, series, The Need for Speed. There was a movie called Tron back in 1982 that was, believe it or not, actually inspired from a video game that Disney was putting out. So the fact is, is that they're a creative inspiration. Video games are for film, just like books are. Like, you know, we obviously get a lot of films from books. We get a lot of films from, you know, uh, from, from, you know, maybe real life, uh, real life happenings in media. Uh, video games <clears throat> are, are no different, right? Um, so how about commercialism, right? Electronic gaming and advertising. Commercialism is as prevalent as it is in most entertainment media. I explained that just a bit ago, right? Very closely connected to the fact that tele, you know, television doesn't exist without advertising, right? Um, you know, a lot of media doesn't exist without advertising, although it's changed a little bit because now it's basically, you know, a model in which, for example, Netflix exists not so much on advertising, but it exists on subscription based. You know, how many you know people are going to buy into Netflix every month, right? But in this case, uh, with, with video gaming, you know, a lot of this is connected to just real dollars, right? So there are a couple of terms here that you should be familiar with. One is called advert games. And let me just define that. And I actually have a good link to this um, that you can click on um, outside of this lecture if you like. But advert games have been used by some of the largest brands in the world over the last 30 years, okay? Their primary purpose is to bring about activity and engagement to capture their users' attention and a link, uh, and link a positive experience to the associated brand. Okay, so Aver Games' primary purpose is to bring about activity and engagement to capture their users' attention and link a uh, positive experience to the associated brand. Because Aver Games are interactive, people don't passively watch like they do with television commercials, banner ads, or any form of traditional advertising. They're encouraged to participate in a way in which not only rewards, but connects the players to the brand and other players via leaderboard, which can evoke real emotion, as you will see below. So if you were look to click on this link, I was looking at some of the more popular ones of today. There's stuff that are connected to donuts, to Wendy's. Um, there's a, uh, you know, uh, there's one here. Uh, let, me see, let me go down here and see it here. Um, there was one that was connected to actually, believe it or not, Kentucky KFC, and that was in Japan. So take a look at how these games, these Aver games are kind of incorporated into the various corp corporate brands. Uh, K here it is, KFC Shrimp Attack. I'm just looking at my screen on the right here. Um, and it says, many companies use games to sell a product or service. KFC Japan approached Gamify 
to create a mobile game to create hype around their new product on the menu shrimp. Um, and so basically, you know, you play this game and it's got a KFC logo in it and, you know, you're, it's surrounding KFC and shrimp, right? But that's what an advert game is. All right. There's also something called in-game ads, uh, or I should say you have in-game advertising, which means big dollars. And in-game ads are a monetization strategy that game developers use to boost their game's revenue. Games developers earn money and get paid by showing mobile games to their users 73% of gamers are happy with the ad-based model of games today. Uh, there are many different types of mobile game advertising strategies and ad formats that developers can integrate into their games to drive mobile game ad revenue, such as rewarded video ads, other wall, I'm sorry, offer wall ads and interstitial ads. But the bottom line is guys, is that when you're playing a game, whether it be on your phone, uh, on your console, see if you can identify, see if there is you know, some big names that, that show up in the background of that game, because the bottom line is if they're there already, you're getting the message. And it's not like, a, say like a television commercial where we could just flip through it and ignore it. It's impossible to ignore if it's built into the game. Um, and of course, when we get to television, we might talk in advertising, we might talk a little bit about how, you know, companies now are actually building like their actual products into actual shows as part of the plot. Brilliant, right? But some of those game in-game ads are static. Some in-game ads are dynamic. The bottom line is, is that, um, you know, you, uh, you have um, a tremendous amount of money that is in the, you know, is in the advertising realm when it comes to uh, what the book calls electronic gaming. Okay, let me, uh, I'm going to just give you a quick preview here, <clears throat> because this is actually, this slide might more apply to part three. Uh, in fact, you know what, I think what I'm going to do is jump down here. So I'm going to, you see this here, um, you see this, this right here, I'm going to move this down. And we're going to move this, actually, let's move this up. There we go. You probably won't see it any more different. Uh, you'll probably see it in order once you, once it's on your PowerPoint, I just fixed it on the fly. But how about uh, this is, uh, so we do, we are going to talk about addiction, right? The fact is, is that these games aren't just being produced for the glory of profit, or I should say as being produced for the glory of profit, there has, there has to be a certain amount of, um, addiction that goes into these games and the addiction is happening, um, in a monetary sense, um, through what we call microtransactions, right? So not only are, are, you know, if you're out there, if you're playing a video game, are you maybe just hooked on the fact that you like playing video games, you like the, you know, there's something in your brain that triggers that you like to play it quite a bit. And, you know, and you do it at the cost of, of social interaction with other people. Maybe, you know, maybe you're putting off doing your homework because you're, you're playing your game too much. Well, there's the other aspect of it, which is the financial aspect of it. It's like, how does a game manufacturer um, essentially continue to get you invested in the, in the same game? And one of those is called the microtransaction, right? Which is this notion that basically, if you have an app, you download the app for free, maybe you have a game that you know, you've paid 50 bucks for, right? And then as you start to unlock more layers of the game, you you have to you might have to pay a little bit more money to do that. Or maybe there is something called a loot box where, <clears throat> for example, uh, I played this golf game um, that was on my phone, and you know I was always looking for more power off the tee, and I was looking for you know a ball that went further, and you know all these little special powers that went along with my golf game. And it would just say here, you know, you can spin the wheel for 99 cents or a dollar 99 will give you, you know, will let you unlock to this. And so that's what a microtransaction is. It's a business model where users can purchase virtual goods with micropayments. You know, you just simply, if you've already given them your credit card number, when you, you know, downloaded the game, you know, it's simply just, hey, click and what do you know? You've got, you know, you've got more on that game and, and it's all done in virtual, right? So it's not like you have to reach in your pocket and grab like, you know, um, a dollar every time. Well, the problem is that there's a lot of people out there who 
get in over their head or kids who don't really know any better. And so um, there is stories out there where there was one guy who was trying to uh, chase, uh, you know, in FIFA soccer was trying to chase, was trying to get a Ronaldo, like a Ronaldo character, you know, and it cost several thousand dollars um, to get that character. So, I mean, bottom line is it's, it's a, they're often used in free to play games to provide a revenue source for developers. And just to put a little money that you can kind of attach to this, the global online microtransaction market is expected to grow from 33 billion in 2020 to 34 billion last year um, and is expected to reach 51 billion by 2025. So there's a real um, there's a real incentive for video game manufacturers to continue with microtransactions and they will speak out of two sides of their mouth about it. So that's related to, you know, obviously addiction. Um, we're going to be talking about that in part three. So I'm going to stop here because in part three, I want to, uh, I want to share with you some of the good, bad, and ugly when it comes to video gaming. So we'll see you, uh, in part three when you click on that lecture. Bye-bye.